everyone, and welcome to Ranches, Rivers, and Rats, an electronic field trip brought to you by Streaming Science. I am Matthew Morton, and I'll be your host for today. Also here with me today is Dr. Mary Harner, Dr. Keith Geluso, Isabella Gomez, Emma Brinley Buckley, <laughs> Andrew Riesenberg, and behind the camera, Dr. Jamie Luitzo. Also, we have 17 schools checking in with us today from all over the country. So here they are. Central City High School, Lawrence Nelson, Pierce High School, Hitchcock County, Ewing Public, Wood River Rural Schools, Twin River Public, Scribner Snyder, Columbia High, Homestead Middle, Eustis Farm Farnham, Burwell Public Schools, Coconut Palm K-8 Academy, Elba Public Schools, and Ainsworth. So like I said, I am Matthew Morton, and I grew up in a small town named Nahaka, Nebraska. Nahaka is just east of Lincoln, where I grew up on a small family farm where we had a row crop operation, but also ran a small herd of cattle as well. I'm currently a sophomore Ag and Environmental Sciences Communications major at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Our goals for today is to teach you guys about the ecosystem and biodiversity of the Sandhills here in, here in Nebraska. We will get you in contact with some of the scientists that work out here almost every day of the year. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the corner of the uh, of your <laughs> of your live web, sh web stream in the box below, or give them to your teachers to type them, and we will try to answer them all. Getting to talk to scientists is one of the coolest parts of my major. The scientists have a lot of jobs, including being indoors in a lab and behind a computer to being outdoors out here in the unique sand hills of Nebraska. So with us today is Dr. Mary Harner and Dr. Keith Juluso. So Mary, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hello everyone, welcome to Streaming Science. My name is Mary and I am an ecologist who studies river ecosystems. I study rivers and the uh, terrestrial areas adjacent to rivers. I work at the University of Nebraska at Kearney in the Department of Communication and also in the Department of Biology. And a lot of my ongoing work is here in the Sandhills. And as Matthew said, um, a great part of this kind of work is that we get to be outside. And some days it's beautiful like yesterday, and some days it's a little cold and windy like it is today. So hopefully our teeth won't shatter too much and you'll be able to hear us over the wind. But welcome, and we look forward to this hour with you. Good afternoon and welcome. We're excited to have all of you. Uh, like Mary just said, uh, most of the days I like to be outside, but today I think it's probably better for you to be inside and we're, again, a little cold. So if we have a, uh, a pause, it's our, it's our brains freezing up today. So uh, I am a professor uh, at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Uh, I consider myself to be mainly a mammalogist, so I study mammals and teach the class mammalogy. I also research and teach about reptiles, amphibians, and turtles, that's being a herpetologist. Um, but when I'm out in the field, I like to basically, anything is fair game in terms of doing research or studying or learning more about things. So I've actually published papers on uh, insects and collaborated and actually published a couple papers on fish. And so. Um, I also like to consider myself uh, something called the natural historians, and so I study the natural history about organisms. And so um, that may, it's kind of a weird term. I'm not actually studying the history or the past about these uh, organisms, but it's a, a natural history is actually a description of natural things. And so when I'm outside, I can uh, describe and, and write about and study their distribution. Uh, their abundance, uh, sometimes diet uh, for things like my, I study bats and rats. You'll learn about the rats coming up soon. Um, but for my bats, when they migrate, if it's a migratory species, uh, when they hibernate, and for any animal, when they reproduce, and for those bats, like when do the baby bats start, first start flying? So uh, that's what natural history is, and I like to also study ecology, the interactions of things out in nature. Um, I enjoy uh, teaching and learning uh, new things and that's being a researcher and a scientist I get to learn new things every time I'm literally outside uh, in the field conducting research and so I will have that passion to share it with my students and so we've got a few of our students here today to show and, and sh uh, uh, story tell about some of their projects and research that they've been conducting with us here in the Sand Hills. And it's great to meet you both. 
So a couple of the keywords that we'll be using today are ecosystem and biodiversity. So Mary, do you mind defining these words for us? So when we use the term biodiversity, we're referring to all of the organisms that live in a place, whether that be plants, animals, microbial communities, it's, it's all of the life in a given amount of area. And when we talk about an ecosystem, we're referring to the living components of the system and how they interact with both the living and the non-living components of that environment. And a lot of the times, researchers who study these ecosystems have to work in those environments as well. So Keith, can you tell us a little bit about the sand hills that you do your research in? Okay, so uh, when you think of Nebraska, you probably think of corn or the corn huskers. And when you drive across uh, the state on maybe I-80, uh, you see a lot of row crop agriculture. And so it might come to you as a little bit of a surprise that actually 25% of Nebraska or one quarter of Nebraska uh, is, uh, is uh, the sand hills. And so uh, this is in north uh, central Nebraska and there's a few parts that dip down into almost southern Nebraska. Um, and, and so we're actually in the Schweitzer Ranch which is in southeastern part of the sand hills. Um, and so some of you are going, uh, sand hills in Nebraska? I don't remember any big sand dunes anywhere. And so we actually have dunes of sand that are uh, 400 feet tall. Some of them are 20 miles long. And so uh, as you might be guessing, because you're not familiar with these pictures of sand, uh, these sand dunes are actually mostly covered by plants. And so lots of different grasses, because this is a grassland ecosystem. We've got uh, sand blue stem, big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass. There's lots of flowering plants. We call those forbs, such as a lot of the sunflowers. There's some roses and uh, pruned uh, kind of shrubs out here. Um, but there are some areas, there's lots of little areas across the sand hills called blowouts. And these are places that you can actually see the sand and the, the wind that blows through these blowouts actually moves it. And so uh, this creates some habitat diversity in the sand hills. And so there are a number of animals and plants and one plant in particular is called the blowout penstemon. And so it is endemic to Nebraska and there is a population or two maybe in Wyoming that I recently read about. Um, so endemic means it only occurs in a really limited area. Uh, and so uh, besides blowout penstemon, uh, some of my animals that I like to study, lizards and kangaroo rats and other mice, uh, actually prefer living in those environments that are uh, basically almost denute of, of plants. Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for all that great info, Keith. And we're really in a unique place here, uh, and we look forward to seeing the kangaroo rats. But <laughs> talking about unique places, right now we're on a specific ranch called the Schweitzer Ranch. So, Mary, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, as Keith mentioned, we're here in the Sand Hills, and on this ranch, we are about three and a half hours northwest of Lincoln, Nebraska, about two hours straight north of Kearney, Nebraska, and about 15 miles west of Burwell, Nebraska, for all of you familiar with, with this part of the area. The Spitzer Ranch is a working cattle ranch, and so there are um, acres and acres of grass that are here to support cattle, but it's also a, an area where the family who lives here operates a nature-based uh, tourism business called Calamus Outfitters. So along with raising cattle, they also uh, provide access to their lands for people to come to take tours out into the landscape to see some of the natural resources, to travel down the nearby Calamus River, to participate in guided hunting trips, and perhaps maybe most famously, to come in the springtime to see some of the grassland birds like prairie chickens and grouse um, on their looks. So most ranches in Nebraska raise cattle, but they're also family operations. So these families have um, specific parts or um, each person in the family plays a specific role in the operation. And these cattle go anywhere to feed the people in Nebraska, to feed the people around the world. So Mary, can you tell us a little bit about the family that lives here? So this ranch is um, owned and operated by the Schweitzer family and ancestors of this family homesteaded this area in the early 1900s and now there are three generations of that family who live and work here and so as Matthew mentioned it's a, it's a family operation and um, they work together both to support the cattle operation but also the visitors who come here to see some of the natural resources. 
And the Sand Hills is a very unique uh, piece of land. Um, so can you tell us why you selected the Sand Hills and most importantly Schweitzer Ranch to do your research on? Well, the Sand Hills are simply a beautiful place to work. Um, we enjoy being here and being surrounded by the biological diversity in this place. But one of the main reasons that we came here is that this is a site of part of a long-term project called the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project. And the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project is a lo larger project that involves placement of long-term camera systems all throughout the Platte River watershed. So here where we're at, this water is part of the Platte River watershed. The water that's here eventually flows to the Platte River. Um, but this watershed extends all the way into Colorado and Wyoming and across Nebraska. And as part of this project, there are 50 cameras that take a picture every daylight hour. Um, and these cameras have been running for a couple of years. And so there are three of those long-term cameras here. Two are on lakes and one is on a creek. And they allow us to see how water changes on this landscape uh, over the course of a day, across seasons, and across years. And so we're working here because there's this long-term uh, archive of information that we can draw upon and also because there are places for teams of researchers and students to come stay supported by some of the buildings that you can see in these images. So how does the research that you do here on Schweitzer, Schweitzer Ranch impact the family? So by working with imagery, imagery, we can see things that we can't easily perceive as a person. Um, when you can take a picture of something, you can uh, capture it and observe it without directly um, affecting the system or disturbing the plants or animals or, or other things in the place. And so we're able to use photography as an observation tool to learn about the natural environment and then to be able to share observations with other scientists, with students, with the family who lives here, with guests who come here to, to share some of the knowledge of what's happening in the place. Um, our cameras capture interesting things about how water moves through this landscape. We're on top of the Ogallala Aquifer here, and so there's a strong groundwater resource, and that groundwater feeds some of the streams, and that water is often, um, in the wintertime, warmer than the air is, and keeps, that wa um, keeps some of those streams with open water that provides water that wildlife and cattle can access even when it's cold and snowy everywhere else. Uh, we'll hear later from Andrew that this water is pumped into stock tanks and provides a reliable water source for cattle as well as a whole variety of other organisms. And um, we can also learn things about how water changes uh, really rather rapidly and how extreme it can be. Some of these sandhill lakes are full to the bank uh, during wet years like we had this year and some years during dry years they're they are completely dry and so water is is always changing and the work that we do helps us understand how it changes and how a variety of species respond to those changes and we can share that with other people yeah and water is very important to the sand hills region out here from the plants and animals who live here to the people who live and work out here as well so mary can you help us understand how the water flows out here in the sand hills Yes, so the water that's here, as in most places, comes from three sources. It comes from precipitation, which we had a lot of this morning. We're still drying out, but uh, rain in the summer and snow in the winter. Um, it comes from surface water flows that come through some of the tributary creeks that we'll see some images of in Isabella's work coming up. And as I mentioned before, it also comes from the ground, particularly from this rich groundwater resource known as the Ogallala Aquifer beneath our feet. So where does the water from the sand hills ultimately end up? Yes, yeah, so a, a common theme that we talk a lot about is how we're all connected by water and we're all part of a watershed. So the water that is here eventually flows into the, the Calamus River, which is behind us, which then flows into the Loop River systems, eventually to the Platte River, and then the Platte River joins the Missouri River near Omaha, Nebraska. So we're part of the Platte Basin watershed where we're at here right now. And that's crazy to think that the water here reaches all the way towards the Missouri River and even farther south than that. Um, so now is time for our first question break. So I will hand it over to Emma. Do we have any questions ready? We do have a number of great questions, so keep them coming. Um, the first question, so Mary, you just mentioned a number of um, rivers and creeks that are around here, the Platte and the Loop. Um, well, Grant would like to know, what is the most unique river you've studied? Oh, <laughs> good question. Um, that's a great question. Um, 
Oh my goodness. I, I like studying aquatic systems that alternate between being wet and dry. And so I've worked on some rivers in the southwestern United States that can carry a lot of water at certain times, have massive floods, and then other times be completely dry. And I'm fascinated by these systems that alternate between wet and dry cycles. Um, because that, what that means is that the organisms who live there um, have life history traits or adaptations that make it possible for them to live in dry conditions, wet conditions, and everything in between. And that's one of the reasons I've been drawn to the sand hills. Some of those sand hill lakes in particular um, can be completely bone, bone dry. And then if after a big rain or a few weeks later, completely full. And so I'm, I'm interested in studying rivers and wetland systems that alternate between being wet and dry. And those occur in a lot of places, but here in the sand hills are one of the places where there's a lot of that variability. Excellent. And a question from Central City High School. When in Earth's history did the sand hills form? All right. Uh, thousands of years ago. So I think it's between, uh, the guesstimate is between like five and eight thousand years ago. Uh, maybe some erosive forces on the Rocky Mountains, but there's other reasons that sand can form uh, down in playas where it dries up and uh, you get kind of the heat, uh, heat and thawing periods. So, um, yeah, five to eight thousand years ago. And up here in the sand hills, can you grow tomatoes? What other oh, sorts, of <laughs> what <are laughs> sorts of crops and, and plants can you grow? I would assume that you can grow tomatoes uh, even farther north, and I know my friend struggles with it in Laramie, Wyoming, <laughs> sometimes. So uh, this the 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 so we don't see many row crop agriculture out here because of the sand, and it's it's not as rich of a soil type as uh, more in the with the clay and silt down in other parts of the state. So. In a good sense, uh, we have great grasses up here for the cattle and livestock and wildlife, but it's not so good for row crop agriculture. So, Excellent. And along with rats, you also mentioned bats. So are bats oh, found oh. in the sand hills? And if so, what species of bat? All right. <laughs> now, that could be a whole nother show to talk about bats here for sure. Uh, yes, there are some bats in the sand hills currently. And so... Um, every town that I go into, especially the brick buildings, they have big brown bats and they're resident year round and so they'll hibernate in attics or maybe root cellars. Um, also in, in netting in places in the sand hills, um, there's migratory species, the red bat, the hoary bat, silver hair bat, and so they migrate through and some of them, the red bat and hoary bat, actually bear their young in cities or along rivers and riparian areas. Um, and so those are the species, but in general there's not a lot of abundance of bats in the sand hills and my question always is what was the bat richness and diversity in the past so going back to the 1840s without much European settlement of the area um, and so I have a feeling we have a lot more bats today um, than in the past so great question let's keep on going no we'll talk about rats later too yeah, and those were some great questions, so keep sending them in as you guys figure them out. Um, <clears throat> but our next segment is, at a university, scientists work with a lot of students to conduct research. And Mary herself has a lot of students working on a lot of different research projects. So Mary, can you talk about some of the research projects you're doing with your students? So I'm going to introduce a student, Isabella Gomez, here in just a minute. But as I mentioned earlier, photography is a common tool that we use in our work, and the cameras that we've been using uh, have been recording over the last few years. But there are also long-term records of landscape change available from pictures that have been taken from airplanes. And so Isabella recently finished at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and she came to our research group with an interest in working with maps and long-term image archives. And so she's going to talk about some of her work, but it connects with what we're doing here because her work has given us a glimpse into changes that have happened over decades rather than over a few months or years. So I'll turn it over to Isabella. Hi everyone, like she said, my name is Isabella Gomez and I'm originally from Central City and I graduated from Central City High School, so hello to everyone watching. 
And as she said, I graduated from the University of Nebraska at Kearney in December of 2017. And while I was at the university, I was able to research many different topics varying all the way from plant evolution to bat behavior and what we'll be talking about here, which is mapping and some aerial imagery. And like Isabella said, she has a really cool project that we're excited to hear about. And it brings in pictures from the 1940s, some aerial photos that uh, were taken of the sand hills. So Isabella, do you want to tell us about those aerial photos and what you did with them? Sure. So like you said, um, I started out with hundreds of historical photos that were taken via airplane that flew over the Sand Hills area, including the Switzer Ranch that we are on right now. And so my objective was basically to take these photographs and kind of piece them together. It was like a big intensive puzzle that I had to figure out um, how these pictures went together and ultimately to create one cohesive image of the area. And so my project uh, mainly focused on the uh, water sources here in the sand hills, including rivers, streams, and lakes. So putting all these together, what did you find out about this area and the sand hills and all the water that you put into one big yeah. picture? Yeah, so um, with my project, uh, we not only pieced them together, but we also added um, layers to it using computer programs called ArcGIS, which stands for Geographic Information Systems. And uh, the process that I was using is called georeferencing. And with that, I added real world coordinates to these images, which gave them basically a, um, a place on the surface of the Earth so we could layer them together um, and compare the different water sources over the years and how they've changed. Um, so one of the main takeaways that my project um, showed us uh, was how the water sources changed over time. For example, um, in the 1980s, uh, there was a dam constructed on the Calamus River, uh, which uh, created the Calamus Reservoir, which is a huge um, water source. You can see uh, it's back there behind us right now. Um, some other things include, as what Mary touched on before, the wet and dry years. We can see a dramatic change over the many years that I was looking at. Um, and just overall how these water sources are so few and far between. Um, the, many of the permanent water sources here in the Sand Hills form kind of a U-shape throughout the area. Um, so as we'll talk about later, some less permanent water sources are needed um, in addition to these permanent, more spread out water sources, which um, are stock tanks. And we'll get to learn about that a little bit more with Andrew's project. So this was a really cool project and it took Isabella a lot of time to make uh, those photos that you guys all were able to see. But Isabella, how do your maps connect with other research that's being conducted out here in the Sand Hills? Yeah, so like I mentioned a little bit before, um, my project really shows the big picture view of the Sand Hills. And that's, that's just one piece of this um, interconnected landscape. So with some other projects that we'll be talking about later, um, we get to see a more close up view, um, zooming way into the uh, individual stock tanks with Andrew's project. Awesome. And you have spent a lot of time on this project. So how is this time that you've um, devoted to this research project help you lead into what you want to do in the future? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, I, while I was at the university, got to do a variety of projects um, in many different backgrounds, which uh, gave me many experiences in the outdoors and nature. And um, I'm ultimately hoping to pursue a career in environmental law to help protect and conserve this land that I love and I'm so passionate about. That's so cool how one research project can lead into a whole future for someone. So next up is our next question break. So if you guys have any questions for Isabella or Mary in the water cycle and how it flows here in the Sand Hills, please submit them now. Emma, do we have questions? Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Um, I would say the first question, Caleb uh, was curious as to um, what are some of the changes you have seen in the water? And you kind of addressed mm -hmm. that with the the uh, reservoir being built um, and some of your other answers. Um, I'm curious if you have seen any changes or if you noticed anything, the difference between the aerial imagery and then being here on the ground, or what are some of the differences you've seen there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I have 
been able to travel. This is my second time being up here in the Sand Hills. And I guess one of the things that surprised me the most is when you're actually here on the ground, you can really feel and tell how far away these water sources are from each other. Um, and when looking at it from the aerial view, they look far away, but you can't really get that sense of um, how few and far between these water sources are. So it's just kind of cool to uh, see it in person and uh, just really appreciate how important and vital these uh, water sources are to the ranchers and the animals and plants that live here. And what were some of the challenges, both technologically or just on the ground, <laughs> that you had with this project? And that could be to both uh -huh. you and Mary as well. Yeah, so I guess I can talk a bit on the computer side of things. Um, with technology, you'll always have issues and things not running as fast as you want to. Um, some of the, um, the programs that we ran took hours and hours to um, go through and complete. Uh, I spent pretty much 40 hours a week the whole summer working on this project is very tedious. These little clicks and finding each matching point and adding the GPS coordinates, um, but it was definitely worth it in the end. Yeah. And one of the questions from Central City is, are there any dangers to the sand hills? And I guess I'm going to follow that up with also what are the, the threats or impacts of water um, and if there are any are they caused by humans or what are some of the difficulties in, in water resources here in the sand hills? Hello Central City. So I think the question is uh, what are the dangers to the sand hills? So dangers to the sand hills are, are things that most ecosystems face. Um, so particularly systems that are still fairly natural. So one of the things that makes the sand hills very special but also can be hard to work in is that it's very remote. There aren't a lot of roads. Um, there's not uh, cell, cell service in a lot of places and that makes it wide open and spacious and a very connected ecosystem. And so some of the, the potential dangers are anything that could divide up that ecosystem because a lot of the animals that live here um, require wide open spaces to move where um, they're not impeded by by roads and, and things that can harm or disturb them and so the term habitat fragmentation anything that divides up a habitat is something that could be a threat um, and anything that pollutes a habitat We've, we're talking today a lot about water and we're all connected by water and so anything that could pollute the surface water or the groundwater in the aquifer could be a threat to the sand hills and much like anywhere else in the world anything that can, pollu can pollute the air and move through the space and so we're um, really fortunate that this is a, a wide open very natural ecosystem and one of the reasons that we're here is to increase awareness about about what is here and so that hopefully um, elements of that can be taken care of well into the future. And those were some, another round of great questions. So, like I said earlier, if you guys have questions along the way, keep sending them in. We love answering all those. But that pegs into our next segment here, which is with Keith and Andrew. So, Keith, you also have a lot of students working on research projects for you. Um, and one of those students is Andrew. So do you want to talk about um, some of the research projects? Uh, so I've been working in the Sand Hills for about uh, 20 years now. I was starting my first project when I was a PhD student. Um, and so mainly studying kangaroo rats and behavior, and so we'll get to some of those projects. But um, I met Andrew a couple years ago in mammalogy class, and he uh, bright-eyed and wanted some uh, experience in the field and, and conducting a, a research project. And so uh, I'll let Andrew talk a little bit uh, his introduction to the project mm -hmm. yeah sure so uh, I'll start off actually just by introducing myself a little bit uh, as you said my name is Andrew Riesenberg uh, I am from Omaha Nebraska senior here uh, at University of Nebraska at Kearney studying wildlife biology and yeah so um, <clears throat> yeah looking into the uh, um, how I got involved um, after mammalogy class. I was just looking for a project and uh, Keith said they had an idea to look at uh, how um, yeah, how different wildlife species are using water sources here in the sand hills um, and so kind of specifically looking at uh, the stock tanks that were mentioned earlier um, just yeah which species are using those and uh, so I was 
in, interested in uh, getting out in the field and uh, kind of looking at that. So. All right. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, maybe the different, like I'll call them treatments, the different water sources, and mm -hmm. um, and then also if you could add, how did you collect the data? Did you actually sit out here in the field and watch those stock tanks day and night for months on end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, first, starting off with um, kind of the different water sources. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, there are these stock tanks, uh, metal rimmed stock tanks that are placed around uh, the ranch, uh, specifically made for cattle um, as they're ranging and foraging on the land uh, just to have access to water since the uh, permanent water sources are kind of patchy um, and so these uh, these stock tanks are filled by water uh, from the underground Ogallala aquifer they're pumped up by windmills and um, the as the water is flowing in there they also some of the water spills out and forms these kind of overflow ponds so those are the two sources we're looking at um, and so we were uh, kind of, <clears throat> yeah, we used, so we weren't directly observing the wildlife like uh, by ourselves. We set up these camera traps that we were using um, to take both pictures and videos of these uh, wildlife species. So we uh, would set them up on posts and stuff around the stock tanks and overflow ponds. Um, and so these cameras are, uh, they're taking both motion uh, picture so whenever the animal comes in view it will trigger that and then also time lapse where um, every 15 minutes they will take uh, a, a photo um, so that's kind of related with the uh, project we talked about the time lapse space and pr uh, project these cameras were uh, given from that project and um, so yeah they're taking pictures both day and night uh, looking at these different wildlife species all right, and so what did you find out? What did you actually see or observe? Or yeah, yeah. So um, we saw a lot of different uh, species of vertebrates. Um, we saw a lot of birds, uh, mammals, and in even uh, amphibian species. So some of the birds that we found were um, uh, some robins, crows, uh, morning doves, um, red-tailed hawks, great blue herons. Uh, starlings, that kind of thing. So a lot of, we found 18, uh, observed 18 species of birds at this one tank and seven mammal species um, including coyote, uh, raccoon, porcupine, uh, skunk, um, <clears throat> mule deer, white-tailed deer, and even elk, which was really exciting uh, since they're not uh, commonly found here in this area, but we, there was one observing. So um, another thing that we observed was a lot of the different uh, behaviors that they were engaging in. So that was another thing we were looking for. Um, well, we, you know, it's obvious that a lot of these species are coming to drink um, from these sources, but they were also engaging in different behaviors like bathing in the shallow overflow pond, uh, water there, and um, feeding as well, um, both uh, digging in the mud and also some predation events from great blue herons hunting uh, northern leopard frogs. So a lot of different, you know, uh, interactions, uses of these water sources. So a lot of really cool pictures uh, um, of these animals. All right, Henny, uh, always when you're doing research in the field, uh, any unexpected items on any fronts mm -hmm. that you learned about? or? Yeah, so this was uh, first off my field, first field uh, research, so it was kind of a big learning curve and uh, just, yeah, ex uh, realizing these, uh, what kind of goes into it. A big kind of one challenge uh, thing that we noticed was um, <clears throat> things just take a lot longer to to set up and do when you're out in the field. Things are unexpected, um, you know, driving to the different stock tanks, setting up the cameras. It always took longer than we expected. Um, you know, we thought maybe we'll just get it done in a, a couple hours and usually took the whole day, even stayed uh, an extra day. So um, things just take a lot longer than expected, but that's that's what goes on with field research. So, so uh, I, Andrew and I are both city boys, and so uh, going out on the ranch, we had to learn a few things. And uh, Andrew, you want to comment about some of the challenge we had just kind of being city boys out here? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we take for granted. I mean, uh, you know, just coming on these um, ranches here, um, there's 
you know, one problem is just even getting through the fences. Uh, it just takes, I mean, it's uh, not as easy as you'd expect. There's barbed wire. There's just all kinds of th uh, crazy things with that. So, yeah, it was it was definitely a learning curve for me uh, coming, you know, originally from being Oma in Omaha uh, to to kind of doing some of this field research. So, uh, Yeah, how many city boys does it take to open and then re-figure out how to close the gate going through these pastures? At so, least two. At least two <laughs> Maybe more sometimes, but yeah. So. So, yeah, there's some challenges there. So I got one more, uh, one more question for you. So again, being city boys, you put cameras up around stock tanks in pastures. What's the number one animal that you get on your cameras, and how many do you get? So yeah, the number one animal is actually not a wildlife species at all. It's actually cattle, which is, I mean, it's kind of obvious since we're here on a ranch um, that you'd expect cattle, but they're, yeah, they're everywhere, and they will <laughs> come to the tanks and, uh, you know, they'll just be licking the camera, getting <laughs> everywhere. So um, we saw a lot of that. Um, you know, we had thousands and thousands of pictures of just cows, and we were, um, yeah, so that was um, one thing is we kind of had to narrow our uh, – our selection of stock tanks to uh, ones without cows. So. We originally put out, I don't know, 16 cameras at multiple different stock tanks. And so uh, one of the stock tanks, the first week, one camera had 65,000 pictures. And I think they're almost all cows. Mm -hmm. And so the camera that we ended up and you're watching the f uh, videos from and the pictures from is one that uh, uh, Bruce at uh, the, the, the rancher here said, hey, there's one over here without cows at this time. So we, we took advantage of that. To, yeah, we uh, were all about that. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a great stock tank. Lots of great pictures that you're seeing right now. So, um, yeah, it was really good to find that one. But, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And I'm sure you guys saw all the cool pictures that they were able to catch of all the different animals that were using the stock tanks and everything. That's really cool. Um, research that you guys have been doing out there on stock tanks but out here on the ranch uh there's um animals big and small like the cattle but keith is here to talk about some of the smaller animals like the kangaroo rats so keith can you talk about some of your research and that you've been doing out here okay so uh again i think i mentioned 20 years or so on and off out here in the sand hill studying kangaroo rats and so the story that i want to paint for you today uh, and tell is about how these rats which most people don't like rats but these rats these kangaroo rats in the sand hills uh, are vitally important for uh, maintaining, in a sense, part of this grassland ecosystem. Um, so uh, kangaroo rats are in the family Heteromyidae. Uh, hetero meaning different, mes meaning mice or mouse, and so we have the different mouse group, this family. Um, uh, they, the kangaroo rats look like kangaroos, and I'll say that the kangaroo rats also have pouch is two pouches unlike the kangaroo it's with one so kangaroos are marsupials these are a completely different group and different um order of these are uh, of, of mammal um, and so i want to talk a little bit about some of their adaptations and how this pertains to the grassland ecosystem so um I've got, I want to tell a little bit about how I catch these animals. So sometimes I use camera traps uh, to um, document their behaviors uh, or leave out something called seed trays and I can kind of go back and look at the footprints and, and measure some different how many seeds I had in there and how many they found, uh, different types of resources. Uh, but um, one of the most interesting ways that I actually uh, can study these mammals, I'm going to pass this on. Andrew, you want to hang on to this? Um, well, there's that bag again. I'm keep this. I think I'll need this bag later on here. I don't know what that's for. So, uh, when I do surveys or go out for certain types of research projects, I use something called Sherman Live Traps. This is a collapsible uh, trap. You can also get them that are non collapsible, but I can carry 40 pretty easily in a box. And so we can pop this right open. Um, there is a front door. There's a little, um, this front door kind of goes be below a little uh, lever there. Uh, I'm going to open up here so I can trick the trap into thinking I'm a mouse. Um, so I put seeds in the front and throw them all the way in the back to hopefully entice the mouse to come in. The mouse will step on the back and the door will catch them. And so uh, this is a huge improvement over snap traps which kill everything out there. So uh, mammalogists can um, come and study 
uh, and, and put tags on them, see how long they live, uh, check out the reproduction, actually put radio collars on them and follow where their uh, burrows are. And so, uh, again, these Sherman live traps are, are wonderful. And for me, I love setting Sherman live traps because it's like Christmas every day. You never know what's in the trap out here. And there's lots of, again, diversity of mice and rats. Where's my... Okay, we're going to... Uh, where's that bag I had here? So I think we need to show you up front and personal uh, kangaroo rats. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to take my gloves off. I have a little bit better control of the mouse or the rat. So kangaroo rats are granivorous. That means they feed on grains or seeds, basically, of all these plants out here in the sand hills. And so when they're going around in their territories, they're looking for different types of seeds. So you'll see that he is jumping and using his big hind feet. Um, they move by something called saltatorial locomotion, by hopping or jumping. And so uh, this is a way, if the habitat is relatively open, that they can run really or run and travel extremely fast. Most mice are quadrupedal, use all four legs uh, to travel, but they're actually relatively slow to, compared to what these, bat, uh, these bats, uh, these rats can do uh, in the field. And so they can jump a couple feet high. Um, and their feet, another adaptation for being out here in the sand hills is their feet are completely furred. And so that's like a big snowshoe. And so they can get more traction on the, what I call loose or friable soil, the sand out here. And so they, they really like the blowouts and open areas. Um, so uh, these animals, one of their adaptations for being uh, a desert animal or uh, arid animal is they have these pouches, okay? It has nothing to do with reproduction like the marsupials, but they have something called an external fur-lined cheek pouch. So when most mice put a seed uh, in their mouth, they literally have cheeks that the, the seed will puff out in, but those seeds will get wet. They're dry, uh, they imbibe water, absorb water. And so if you're a desert animal, you're gonna lose a lot of your uh, body water over time by handling all these seeds and putting them directly in your mouth. So this, uh, these, this group of rats, or mice and rats, have an external fur lined cheek pouch. So if you put a seed into your cheek pouch, it stays completely dry. And then they will, what we call, scatter hoard these um, cash, uh, seeds into small caches in their territory. So I'm going to try to show you an external fur lined cheek pouch here of this kangaroo rat here. Sometimes they behave, sometimes they don't. Let's see if we get them going coming up here so uh, kind of gently pin him behind the head here he will kick actually it's a she will kick me I'm sure but let's see if we can get a close-up look I'm gonna getting old here I gotta move my glasses down here all right we'll get you we'll get it this is a fun part of biology right so uh, there we go can see inside that little cheek pouch there so again it's fur lined and external and uh, again a great um, adaptation uh, for being in these uh, in, in somewhat arid environments grasslands are somewhat arid so I want to make this complete the story here so these animals will take seeds um, from the environment um, they will cache them in um, little piles so we'll go maybe 15 to 50 seeds depending on the species of plant they will plant them, plant, I already used the wrong word, they will bury them, which is basically planting the seed, about an inch deep. And so that's ideal for germination. And so following these kangaroo rats, not all of them uh, will find all of their caches again. Uh, sometimes these animals will get predated and then those seeds are available for germination. So this spring after these rains here, uh, it'll warm up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so some of those plants that are coming up are literally planted by kangaroo rats. So a mutualistic interaction. Um, some kangaroo rats and other mice will just take seeds from the environment and stick them in their burrow. And that's more predation because none of those seeds will ever have a chance to grow. So when we think about the sand hills and this amazing um, grassland uh, and and the grasses and the plants and the forbs that the cows are feeding on the other wildlife are feeding on a lot of those plants were originally planted um, by these kangaroo rats so a neat little story there that's incredible to see how these small little rats can plant uh, 
different seeds all across the sand hills to grow what you see all across the prairies. But Keith, as you said, in these traps, you can't really see what's inside them. So how do you know what you caught when, when uh, you see a trap is set? Okay, so um, is there another microphone? Make them more easy. All right, so like I said, it's like Christmas. You never know. Uh, I've caught tarantulas. I've caught a lot of little birds because they're going after the seeds too. Um, caught lizards and occasionally I catch snakes and uh, I think it's now three times that I've had baby rattlesnakes in the traps which I didn't know originally were in there. So when mice get nervous they do a little foot drumming and so it kind of sounds like a little rattle and so when I have these traps I'm like oh I hear a little rattle foot drum of a mouse no big deal and so I open it up how do you what's inside well you look inside and there's my little finger like two inches from the rattlesnake's face and kind of freaks me out a little bit um so you never know but um i just love being out in the field because i'm, I'm even though i'm it's, it's a struggle for me because i'm checking the traps and i'm interested in what's in the traps but the birds are calling so sometimes i have binoculars on me and then the lizards are running um and so as I, yesterday was amazingly beautiful 75 and sunny out here and so the lizards were out and the snakes were out here so i also had a snake that i captured so um let me pass this on again here yep, I got it. and it is 245 okay so if we want to go to questions after all right so i'll quickly grab a snake so we can see it this is a, a species of this is a species of garter snake uh it's going to be pretty cold uh, there are two species in the sand hills. Uh, this is the common garter snake, Thamnophis um, sertalis. And so I'll kind of let you end on that, and then maybe we'll switch over to some questions. Yeah, so Emma, do we have any questions for Keith and Andrew and anyone else? Yeah, we have a number of really great questions, and I'm not sure we'll have time to get to all of them, but uh, we'll get to a couple, and then um, if you can follow up later, uh, Matt will follow up with you all. But um, so the first question comes from Pierce. How do kangaroo rats interact with cattle and other livestock in the sand hills? Um, how do they interact with cattle and other wildlife? So cattle, I'm thinking about uh, the story that I just mentioned about planting the seeds in the grass for them to feed on uh, the next generation, so at least some of the next generation of the plants. Um, the other wildlife, they are a food source for uh, owls and coyotes, uh, badgers. I have a trail cam. I just checked the camera, uh, the pictures last night on the, the SD card, and we have a badger right in front of the camera trying to dig up a kangaroo rat. So they are a, 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 a prey source for a number of the uh, predators uh, in the area. And do kangaroo rats have to drink water? A question from Central City. Oh, that's a, I think that's a prime question there. So, actually, no. They don't have to drink free water. Uh, there's something, uh, if they eat carbohydrates, uh, in the process of cellular respiration, you make something called metabolic water. And so if you don't eat a lot of food items with nitrogen, uh, or you think your proteins have the nitrogen, the C's, H's, O's, and N's, if you don't have the nitrogen in there, if you do, let's say, if you do have nitrogen, you've got to use some of your body water, even the metabolic water or free water, to pee that out. Is that, can I say that on this camera? Pee that out. Uh, uh, urination. There we go. Um, and so, um, so they will actually choose, uh, they already somehow may uh, know, uh, they will eat foods that are not high in protein if it's a really dry environment and just use the metabolic water. So they don't need standing free water to drink. Very neat creatures. Oh. As a high school student, what is the best way to prepare for a career studying sandhills plants or wildlife? A question from Pierce. I, I think I that. got that question, so that's a really good question. Um, I think one thing as a high school student, I mean, uh, just you know, seeing which things you're interested in, um, like kind of looking at the, uh, <clears throat> you know, if there's a specific species in the sand hills that you're uh, interested in studying, just maybe doing a little bit of uh, searching on the internet for that, asking your teachers. Um, would be a good thing uh, just to yeah kind of generate some interest and then seeing you know uh, if you as you go into uh, later on um, if there's ideas that you could do with that uh, like maybe a research idea or um, but yeah just like 
kind of seeing what things in the sand hills you're interested in, even just in general in biology, um, just you know, kind of searching that up a little bit, and yeah. All right. Um, I just want to say that uh, probably do well in high school, so then maybe you can get into college. When you do get to college, don't be afraid of us, professors. Okay, we're normal people. Well, sort of, <laughs> mostly <laughs> normal. I don't know, uh, but come and tell us your interest, and so uh, interact with uh, the professors and let them know your interest. And so good things will happen if you if we know that where there's a common goal that you need to you want some experience. And so uh, we have grants, we have lots of different students and projects, and so. Um, just kind of letting yourself be known and, and your interest in, in what you want to study. That doesn't have to always be science, too. So, yeah. And I have a feeling that Keith could probably write a book about this question oh, no. from Ellen Raiders. Have you ever been bit by any creatures? Um, probably the question will be, which animals haven't I been bitten by? Uh, so, but I've never handled a, a venomous snake because I'll just say every other animal that I've held, I've been bitten by. Uh, and so you try to be careful, but day after day of handling mice and bats, uh, mistakes, accidents do happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, most of them, the, I work with very small animals, bats and rats. I'm not sure if I dealt with bigger animals like badgers or something. <laughs> mm. um, but, uh, you know, we learn how to handle the animals properly, but uh, accidents do happen. So, again, that's why myself, I never, I, even though I have the capability of, and I study sometimes uh, venomous snakes, uh, I use snake sticks and other ways of handling them. So, yeah. And how did you get into studying kangaroo rats? Um, how did I get into studying kangaroo rats? Uh, so uh, this will s tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I, my dad is a, bat, is a bat biologist and a mammalogist, and so at a very early age, I was introduced to the natural world. And so I actually had Desi, the desert kangaroo rat, as a pet growing up. And so it wasn't that exciting of a pet, but because it was so different, uh, it was kind of cool. And so it was mainly nocturnal and jump up and down and run in a hamster wheel. So uh, I fell in love with them as a kid. So Excellent. Are there any endangered species living in the sand hills? Are there uh, endangered species? So the blowout penstemon is, uh, I believe it's endangered status uh, with the Endangered Species Act. Um, okay, hooping cranes come through for sure. I believe there's some either piping plovers or least turns that might also use some of the, the rivers and sandbars and maybe the edges of some of the, the sand hill lakes. Uh, let me think here. Uh, they took bald eagles off, but they still might be threatened. Um, uh, so those are the ones that are popping in my head. Mary, you want to? Uh, a prairie fringed orchid is a federally protected plant uh, out in the sand hills. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent questions. So. Have you drawn any correlations or lack of between livestock and native species? Question from Grant. Okay, say that again here. It's a little a deep question there. <laughs> it is. It is a good question. Okay. Yeah, it's basically what is the relation, or have you found any relationships between livestock and native species? Uh, you know, that's, n I'm going to pass on that question. That's not my research area. Uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I'll just say that grasslands um, need fire and grazing um, for sustainability of grasslands. And so when we don't put fire or have more grazing, uh, one of the exotic species that's popping up all over is I can look around, I can find eastern red cedars. And so uh, we need to keep on uh, having ways to help these prairie systems continue in the future. And so those are two, two means grazing and fire great answer um so i think i will pass the microphone back to matt at this point 
Awesome. And I do think we went over time a little bit. So everyone that's still on, if you still have questions that haven't been answered, feel free to send those in or email them to the streaming science email that we've been using. And we'll be able to get back to you guys with the answers to those questions. But thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you all learned something about the ecosystem and biodiversity of the Nebraska Sandhills from these great scientists and research students that have been helping us out all through today. Um, don't forget to check out StreamingScience.com to see more videos and podcasts to help out in your science classes. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.